you're going to want expansion space. You're going to want to, um, if there is that space next door that you might be interested in expanding into later on, make sure you get into a right of first refusal on that space. That way, if it ever becomes available, you're going to get the first shot at it. Uh, the accessibility of a loading dock. This is one of those things that some folks don't think about until that first distribution truck shows up, distributor truck shows up to pick up a pallet of beer and they say, all right, where do you want this thing? And say, so, I don't know, I guess you just roll the beer out the door. No, they want a nice accessible loading dock so they can roll the pallets out the back and uh, load up the truck. Um, structural components. Uh, what I mean by this is you need to make sure that that building is structurally sound for a brewery. Uh, that building may have been previously used for something else. Maybe it was a repair shop or something like that. It was great for driving cars in and out of. But once you put a 20 barrel fermenter on the floor, uh, bad things might start, start happening. This is, you have a lot of heavy equipment there. Uh, you have a lot of moisture going on. Make sure that your space is structurally sound. Um, I've, I've seen horror stories happen where, uh, folks get into a space and, uh, they start going into their build out process only to realize that they need to rip out and replace the entire floor. That's an incredibly expensive process and involves laying a new foundation, uh, or a new base under the floor. It's a, uh, a very large unexpected expense. Um, Retail, uh, retail elements. So you're going to want to be sure if you're going to have a tasting room, uh, if you're going to have a pub, it, you need to make sure that your zoning is going to be appropriate for that, uh, that the city is going to allow you to have that use and that you're going to be able to have the size of retail space that you want. Um, an issue that a lot of local breweries around here run into is, uh, if you get into these sort of more commercial slash industrial type spaces, you can run into the, the issue of uh, not having enough allowable retail space. So you've got this beautiful area for your brewery, and then the city says, well, only uh, five or 10% of that space can be used for your tasting room. That sometimes is not enough for you to work with. So make sure those, those are worked out in advance. Um, parking and traffic, always an important consideration. Uh, sometimes if you're gonna be increasing the traffic at your space, if your use is going to increase the traffic substantially, the city might make you pay for that increased use. Um, you can uh, be subject to charges for street improvements and sidewalk improvements and things like that, which can get up into the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars very quickly. So make sure you deal with those issues with the city um, beforehand. And when I'm talking about dealing with city issues, often the best person to work with on that is your architect. Uh, a good qualified architect knows the ins and outs of the, the municipality or the county, with whatever uh, body you're working with. They'll know who to talk to. They'll know the permitting process. Uh, work with them and with your general contractor on, on getting the proper um, use permits and, and building permits. Uh, outdoor seating can be uh, one of those things that you just anticipate you're gonna be able to do when you get into your space. It's got this really nice little patio out back, uh, or maybe it has some sidewalk space and you're envisioning some bistro tables out there. Well, make sure that's actually gonna work. First of all, with the landlord, uh, you're gonna have to get permission from the landlord to do that. Your state licensing body is probably gonna wanna see evidence of that permission. Um, and then you're gonna wanna make sure that your license covers that entire of outdoor seating area, uh, if you're intending on having that be an on-premises consumption area. Um, noise and odor limitations, this is another one we've run into trouble with before, where um, it looks like a great place for a brewery. You think it's gonna fit in really well with the community, but maybe there's a lot of uh, office space around, or maybe there's some, uh, some residential areas surrounding your brewery, and that may limit your use, just simply because of the noise and odor that comes out of a, out of a brewery naturally. Uh, that's expanded, of course, if you're gonna have a pub with live music and all that kind of stuff. So make sure that um, your use is gonna fit in with the community and you're not gonna get objections from the community on that. Sometimes that can be the basis for being denied a, uh, a liquor license. Uh, neighborhood acceptance goes right along with that. Uh, I always advise my clients, when you're going to get your licensing, one of your first stops should be your neighborhood association 
uh, or even just your direct neighbors around you. Go and talk to people. Let them know what you're doing. Uh, talk, present your business plan to the association to let them know what you're doing. That way you can head off any uh, unfriendliness from the neighborhood. And when you're going through the permitting process, which usually involves some kind of uh, period for the community to object, you're not going to have any surprises there. You're not going to have a neighborhood association who steps in and says, this, this doesn't really fit in with our plan. So uh, let's talk more directly about the actual terms of the lease. Um, leases are very, they're very hefty documents. They, they have a lot of legal terms in them. They have a lot of business terms in them. They are heavily, often heavily negotiated documents. I highly suggest using a lawyer to, uh, to negotiate these agreements. Um, you will be very happy that you did when you're ready to move out or if you're ready to um, terminate your lease earlier than you expected to, or if you need the landlord to do something, uh, you can write in some, some really nice provisions that will help you in the future. Because otherwise, you're going to be signing a document that the landlord gives you. And there, those, of course, are going to be very landlord-friendly documents. They're going to be uh, provisions that pretty much only benefit the landlord. So you need to balance that agreement out quite a bit. Um, one thing to consider when negotiating the lease tenant improvements. Uh, landlords, in a lot of cases, will actually pay for your improvements to the property. They recognize that those improvements benefit them, them as well as it benefits you because it's increasing the value of the property uh, and because it's an incentive to get you into the property. Um, one thing to be careful with there is sometimes these seem like really sweet deals where a landlord says, yeah, we'll throw 30 or 40 grand at, at your build out and we'll, we'll put in a, a ADA accessible bathroom. We'll put in this and that. Um, that sounds really good. Sometimes they're just going to build that price into your rent uh, if you haven't negotiated the rent yet. So just be, be cautious of that. And sometimes when they do build it into the rent, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's basically like the landlord is financing your build out a little bit. So instead of paying there, that 30 grand up front to your contractor to get that work done. Your landlord is going to pay it, and you're going to be paying it over the term of the lease, which may be five, 10 years or whatever. Um, rent and rent abatements. These are also a very commonly negotiated part of a lease. Uh, your a rent abatement means that uh, you might get a couple of months free on your rent. Uh, again, sometimes the landlord will just take those two months and spread it out over the remain, remainder of the lease term. But for a, for a startup company, those two or three months of rent abatement can be extremely important. You can, uh, you can use those, use those uh, amounts for your build out. Uh, you're not going to have any cash flow going on at that time. So it's really great to be able to have some free rent while you build out your premises and get your cash flow going. And usually you can get uh, two or three months is pretty standard. And I've seen, uh, I've seen, a lot more than that as well. I've seen as I think as high as six months rent abatement before. Um, and of course, just negotiating the rent is a very important piece. It's um, that's good. You're going to be stuck with that for quite a while. Uh, and the next item is term and renewal options. Negotiate your rent for the renewal option as well. If you're negotiating a five-year lease with a five-year renewal option, you should try to figure out basically what your rent's going to be. In, the, in that five-year renewal, or at least figure out how you're going to determine what the rent's going to be. That way, you don't get into your renewal, and you're just uh, you're just stuck with a uh, with a rent increase that you didn't expect. Uh, and I've seen some leases that are particularly nasty, where the landlord has a ton of discretion in raising the rent. They can raise it on a year-by-year -year basis. And I've had clients contact me and say, "A rent just keeps going up." Like. Five ten percent a year, and we don't we didn't expect it. It's not what we thought the lease said, but sure enough, the lease has a provision that allows the landlord to raise it up to a certain amount. And we have a question here. It goes with the next topic: utilities. Okay, seems like upgraded sewer and power would be a bit prohibitive for landowners as a common to request such things. Um, that I would put that under the tenant improvement category. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable to request upgraded sewer and power. It's also perfectly reasonable for a landlord to say, I don't think so. Uh, so 
yeah, ask for it. See if you can get it. It's one of those items that can be a um, it can be a, a pretty large uh, a pretty large item. So if you can get the landlord to cover it, even if he builds that into the rest of the lease term, into your rent for the rest of the lease term, that's a pretty sweet deal for you. Um, but if you if it requires too much of an upgrade in sewer and power, just be wary of that as well. Sometimes that will that will make the whole project cost prohibitive, particularly if sewer. Um, power is not an unusual thing at all to have to upgrade, but sewer upgrades are ridiculously expensive uh, and sometimes absolutely necessary. The, the city might require it. Um, your, your just the fact of your business might require it. You just may have that much output that you need to improve it. So it's worth asking for it for sure. Uh, and it's another one of those things that it can benefit the landlord. So they, they certainly would consider that as well. Uh, what's, a, what's a considerable percentage of rent increase is a common that landlords take advantage of business booming to increase your rent? Um, that is, that's a great question. And it's a, um, a considerable percentage of rent increase, you know, like a, a 3% increase per year, I'd say is pretty reasonable. If you're getting up into like 6 or 8%, that's really high, uh, so just be wary of those. And uh, it, the best thing to do is, instead of just looking at it as a percentage, lay it out year by year. This is what my rent is this year, and with this increase, this is what it's gonna be this year. That way you can actually see the, the amounts in front of you. Um, and when you get into a, a, lease ex, a lease extension, instead of saying it's gonna be this percentage rent increase, maybe it benefits you to have it as a, a market value increase. Uh, because maybe that increase isn't going to be, you know, it's not going to be ridiculously high. And maybe the the area um, that you're in isn't increasing in value that much. So maybe it shouldn't be as high as uh, like a 5% increase every year. That'll give you a chance to renegotiate it. One of the uh, nasty traps I've seen people get into is you you have this wonderful brewery that starts out in a, an area that's, you know, sort of a nice area, but on the it's kind of up and coming and the brewery contributes to the um, improvement of the neighborhood the neighborhood improves the rents go up and the rent of the brewery ends up going up i've actually seen that happen a couple of times and it sucks but that's uh, that's the nature of the beast there if, if you as the value as the property values in the neighborhood goes up and the rents in the neighborhood go up your rent's going to go up too that's why you need to negotiate these things in advance and stay away from anything that allows the landlord discretion in determining your rent increase. Make sure that's nailed down. Yeah, the, um, Denver is a good example. Yes. Of that. Yeah. 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 Wincoop was the leading entrant and changed the whole surrounding. Yeah, it happens. I think it happens pretty often. We all know that breweries are good for the neighborhood, right? <laughs> Uh, what's the max amount of time you've seen a landlord give for a rent abatement? Uh, I think I said six months, um, but more standard is about three months. Uh, build out and approvals can take a long in breweries, so how often are folks paying rent before having any source of income? That's kind of the whole point of the rent abatement. You want to try to make the rent abatement match your period of of no income. So if, if you anticipate a three-month build out and you know it's going to take you about three months to get your TTB, uh, brewers notice, build in a three month abatement if you can. Um, that will allow you to not pay rent until you have a source of income coming in. Uh, a lot of this is just up to negotiation. It, you can request anything from the landlord and you might not get it. They might not give you any rent abatement. And that's at that point, you just have to decide how, how worthwhile the space is. Uh, I also recommend getting a, a qualified real estate, commercial real estate broker to help you in these transactions. In most states, the broker is going to be paid by the landlord. So um, it's a service that you're not paying for, except for there's an argument that's built into the lease amount. Um, but the landlord is paying for your broker. So use a qualified broker who will know how to negotiate these things and ask for the appropriate amount of abatement, uh, tenant improvements, and so forth. Um, you're right. I think Josh. I recommend including a provision to buy the property at the end of the lease term. I think that might be on the next slide, but I'll go ahead and touch on that. Um, that kind of uh, right of first refusal on a purchase or a purchase option, um, I think that's wonderful to build in, into a lease. Uh, it's uh, one of those provisions that the landlord's either going to agree to do it or they're not. Um, it's worth asking for because you just never know. It may be 
Maybe it's a deal breaker for you. Maybe you have to have that purchase option or you're not interested in the property because your business plan has you buying that property after so many years or whatever, it's ready to be sold. Uh, the way that basically works is uh, at any point that the landlord decides to sell the property, they have to give you at least as good of a deal as they're gonna give uh, a third party on it and they have to give you the first shot at buying it. A lease option is more, uh, or a, a purchase option is more where um, at some specific point in time, you're going to have the option to purchase that contract. So maybe in five years, an option kicks in and you can purchase the purchase the building at a, at a certain fixed price or negotiated price or uh, you know, formula determined price. Um, well, Sam has here. a lot of comments. He has a chain of pub restaurants, right, Sam? Giving some feedback on his experience. So let's see. Yeah, lease zone is always recommended if possible. That's a good point. Anything can be put into a lease contract just depends on the landlord. Absolutely. It's like I said, they're heavily negotiated documents. So it, landlords can vary so much. And a lot of it depends on if they're a sophisticated landlord. Uh, maybe they're a uh, single unit owner and they've never rented a building out before or run into that. And those can be very difficult situations. And then at the same token, you can have single, uh, single unit owners where they're extremely friendly and they all, they're they super excited to get a brewery in their building and they'll give you a sweet deal. Uh, it all, all depends on the landlord. Um, and that's another reason to get a broker involved. They know how to, they know how to deal with those different situations. Uh, landlord's lease includes a 4% management charge for any improvements supposed to cover its cost of reviewing and approving plans. Is this unusual? Um, we're getting a little bit in the nitty gritty on this, but it's uh, management charges aren't that unusual, um, especially in a what's called a triple net lease where uh, you're going to be paying for all of their uh, expenses, their insurance, taxes, uh, maintenance, all those charges are, are going to be paid by the tenant. Um, it's uh, the management charge is just one of those one of those extra charges. It's also uh, like Sam said, it's um, it's uh, uh, it's negotiable. You can always negotiate those management charges. They may not work with you on it, but you can always ask for a reduction in that. Um, and sometimes what I'll do is ask, why is it 4%? What am I getting for this? How much work are you actually putting into this, into this management? Because sometimes it's just another way for the landlord to tag on some income for a property. Um, and sometimes they're paying a third party manager to do it. And that's, that's where it comes from. Okay. So, uh, where were we here? Utilities. Utilities. We talked about that a little bit, but uh, you brought up a great point. I forget who brought it up, but it, it was a great point that you need to look at things like your sewer and your, your electricity. Uh, make sure that not only do you negotiate who's going to be paying for those upgrades, but negotiate that you can do the upgrades at all. Uh, some landlords are very shy about having um, having certain improvements done that are going to sort of change the nature of the building. So make sure they're okay with you going in and putting in a new sewer sewer line or putting in a higher amperage electricity. Um, and uh, you know if they're not going to do it, it's not the right space for you because it's probably going to be an essential essential piece of the deal. Uh, same with any tenant improvements. I always tell uh, tell my clients get consent to the extent possible. Get a consent for those improvements in advance. Most leases are going to have a provision built in that gives the landlord. Uh, basically veto power over your tenant improvements. They have to be reasonable in it in most cases, but they'll they'll be able to tell you, no, I don't want you to do that. Make sure they're on board beforehand. Get them to sign off on your blueprints beforehand if you have them. Uh, that way there's not going to be any, just any uh, issue arising out of that. Um, indemn indemnification. This is a, a very important legal term. It's also one of the more negotiated legal terms in a, in a lease agreement. What that basically means is it's deciding and um, in any particular liability when something happens to a third party and some liability arises out of that, such as an accident, death, uh, and it's something like that, who's gonna end up paying for it in the end? So in other words, uh, somebody slips and falls on the property um, and it's because you left, uh, you left a bunch of water on the brew, 
the on the brewery floor or something like that. Somebody's on a tour, they slip and they fall. Landlord's going to want you to indemnify them for that, and they want it to come out of your pocket instead of theirs. Of course, that's going to be insured, um, so your insurance is going to be taking care of that. Um, but in the same token, if something happens, uh, you know, maybe the landlord fails to perform a certain kind of maintenance on the uh, electric system and somebody gets shocked, that's the landlord's fault. You want them to pay for it. If you get sued for it, you want them to uh, indemnify you, cover your defense costs, uh, and cover any kind of liabilities that arise out of that, out of something that's their fault. So it's basically attributing the fault to one part of the or the other. Um, assignment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of a, the nature of the business that you're in is you're going to expand and maybe you out, outgrow your space and it's time to move on to a larger space. Uh, or maybe the space just isn't working out for you for some reason. You need to have the ability to assign your lease to another party. Landlords uh, and owners are, are generally going to want some kind of say in who that goes to and whether the person is qualified, but you need to at least have something in there that that requires them to accept that next tenant if it's a reasonable tenant for them to accept. Um, and sometimes that's just what the assignment provision says. It's they they will not, it's subject to their consent, but it's subject to their reasonable consent. So they can't unreasonably say, eh, I don't want this next tenant in here because I just don't, I don't like them. Um, it has to be something reasonable. Uh, and sometimes you'll see qualifiers in there, like it has to be a tenant that has so much capital, it has to have a certain type of use um, uh, that they're going to use the space for. Uh, it'll have a list of qualifiers for who, who might qualify as a, a, a next tenant. Um, personal guarantees. Uh, these are, you know, if at all possible, try to avoid personal guarantees. Uh, if you're not familiar with that concept, it simply means um, you're going to be entering into the lease as uh, as your business entity, as your LLC or your corporation, a personal guarantee says, okay, yeah, my LLC has said they'll do all these things in the lease, but if they don't do it, I personally am going to take care of it. And that includes the payment of rent. So it's just like when you get in a loan and you personally guarantee the loan, you're on, you're personally on the hook for all those obligations. If you can avoid it, great. Um, startup companies have a lot of difficulty avoiding personal guarantees. Landlords like to see that, that kind of, uh, that kind of security behind their leases. Uh, what I've seen some folks do uh, and what we've negotiated pretty effectively before is maybe you pay a larger deposit and get out of your personal guarantee. Uh, instead of paying $2,500 deposit, you pay like a $5,000 or $7,500 deposit, but it's not personally guaranteed. Uh, you can also sunset your personal guarantee, personal guarantee where after the first lease term or after a couple of years of the first lease term, the personal guarantee is going to expire. Um, that way, you know, that makes sense. The landlord's gotten the benefit out of your arrangement uh, and they're gonna let you off the hook personally after that. So it's at least worth trying for. Uh, we're still on leasing. I'm gonna to try to scream through these a little bit so we can keep moving on. Um, but these are brewery specific terms. Uh, one, of, one of the most important terms that we put in a, a a brewery or uh, any beverage company's lease agreement or any any company that's subject to uh, alcohol liquor licensing is a termination contingency. Um, what this means is you find this great space, you negotiate the lease, you're ready to sign the lease, but you can't really even start your TTB process until you are under the lease. Um, you, in some states, can't start your liquor licensing process until you're until you're signed into the lease. Um, so make sure that that lease has a contingent, contingency that says, if something happens or for some reason I can't get my TTB brewer's notice, my uh, state liquor license, uh, my city or county building permits, or my change of use or zoning, uh, uh, zoning, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, the variances, um, you need to be able to get out of your lease. Uh, landlords hate these things. They hate the, the uncertainty of them. They hate having uh, signing into a lease where you can get out of it that easily. But it's super important for you, so negotiate it in there somehow. 
Sometimes that means uh, you're going to sacrifice your security deposit. Sometimes you're going to, it means you're going to sacrifice two or three times your security deposit. But in the end, that's going to be way better than having a five-year lease for a brewery that can't serve beer or make beer. Um, so that's, that's a pretty important piece. Uh, usually those contingencies are going to be, you can make them about three months out, four months out if possible. Just build in enough time where you can get your licensing. Uh, use of the premises. Just make sure the lease specifies how you intend to use the premises um, and how you might use the premises later on down the line. Maybe you're a, a brewery now with a little tasting room, but maybe in three or four years you want to have a little pub component of that, start serving food. Make sure your brewery allows for that. Make sure if you're going to have live music, make sure it allows for that. Uh, you don't want your landlord coming in and saying you're in breach of your lease because you're using it for something that you, you didn't specify that you can use it for. Um, business hours. Uh, sometimes it's important. Landlords will require you to list your business hours. Um, just, just make sure to, uh, again, contemplate the future. Make sure that you're allowing yourself uh, enough leeway in that. Maybe your actual open hours are 12 to 8, but maybe you are brewing from 8 to 12. So uh, make sure that you are including all of your use of the space. Uh, outdoor space, we talked about that, but make sure it's in the lease, identified as usable by you, um, and you're going to you're gonna need that anyway for your liquor licensing. Uh, environmental covenants, um, it's just uh, things like uh, if there's any kind of issue with um, uh, with any kind of like hazardous waste that's going to be on site, like you might have uh, a caustic cleaner that you're going to be using in your brew house, uh, make sure that that's listed as something you can keep on site. Mo a lot of leases are going to have some kind of environmental provision that says you can't have any of this kind of stuff on the premises. You can't use this kind of stuff on the premises. Um, caustic cleaner is hazardous waste, technically. So make sure that you are listing that as an exception. Um, alterations, uh, we talked about that. Make sure you, you get consent for those in advance. Uh, also, an important piece of that is make sure you know what's going to happen at the end of the lease term with your alterations. If you build this beautiful bar into your tap room and your, uh, your plan is if you ever move on, you're going to move that bar to your next tap room, Make sure you get that in your consent to put that bar in. Make sure the landlord specifies, I'm okay with you taking that with, with you when you leave. Otherwise, uh, he might claim that, well, because it's bolted, because this thing's built into the facility, it's actually a fixture. It's, it's, a, it's a fixture of the, of the uh, space, and it belongs to me, the landlord. On the same token, if you plan on leaving something behind, or if, you, uh, gonna, if you're going to put in an improvement and you know you're not going to want to rip that improvement out in the end, Make sure you specify that. Some leases will say that you need to return the premises to the state it was in when you began the lease. You don't want to have to do that if you've done a substantial amount of build out to the place and where you'll be ripping out walls and peeling paint off. Um, that's unusual for a landlord to do that, but sometimes the uh, termination of a lease isn't the most friendly time in the relationship. Um, insurance. Uh, there's going to be an insurance provision in every lease. It's going to tell you how much liability insurance you need to get, what type of insurance you're going to get. And that might include uh, everything from your uh, general liability insurance to your uh, liquor liability insurance to your auto insurance. I mean, they're, they can be pretty specific about these things. And a lot of times that's what's going to dictate how much insurance you get for your company. Um, some some uh, landlords like to get like you to have more insurance than you would normally want to have. Um, send that provision to your insurance agent, have them review it, have them tell you if they feel it's a reasonable amount of insurance. If you are a, a startup in a 5,000 square foot facility and they're asking you for $5 million in liability insurance, question that and negotiate it down. Uh, you're going to be paying a lot of money for that extra insurance. It's not going to be doing anybody any good. Um, and the landlord, you know, maybe that's just part of their form. Uh, I've had that happen before where it's, it's a, you know, large multi, uh, facility landlord. They use the same form for everything. They just put five million bucks insurance in every lease. 
and they don't really intend it to be part of a 5,000 square foot space, but it just, it's in there. Make sure you get it changed. Um, all right, let's move on. I think we're actually finally done with real estate. <laughs> yes. Uh, licensing, we're going to breeze through this. Uh, we touch on this more when we get into um, the 404 class. Um, these are the just the areas of uh, the basically regulatory areas you're going to want to look at. And that's the FAA, uh, the IRC, the Internal Revenue Code, uh, the TTB regulations, of course, getting your brewer's, brewer's notice. Um, that's a, a pretty fairly complicated uh, and painful process going online and, and going through the TTB application process. But um, as long as you're thorough with it, it's, it's not too bad. And that's something that uh, you'll find that some lawyers perform that service as well. And I've seen some consultants that do that as well for folks. Um, each state's going to have its own liquor laws. They're vastly different among states. Um, it, you know, most of them adhere to the three-tier system, but there are a lot of variations to that system. Uh, so make sure to consult your state's regulatory uh, scheme. Most of the time, you can just go to your local Al Alcoholic Beverage Commission uh, website, and they're going to have a page that's super helpful for going through the process of getting your liquor license, describing all the regulations involved. Um, and I'd say it's actually well worth it to a lot of them will have a book basically that they can give you that's going to have all the regulations, the statutes and regulations that apply in that state. Read through the thing just just to have a, like a working knowledge of it. And it's extremely boring and tedious to do so, um, but it's worth it just to have sort of a working knowledge of, of the state's liquor laws. Um, sometimes there are going to be local liquor laws. Uh, as I put in the outline, state liquor license typically will not trump local laws and codes, so you need to pay attention to those things. Um, you can have things like uh, weird things like uh, Portland, I forget what they called the, the bill, but Portland recently uh, tried to instate a, a law where in certain areas you couldn't sell over a certain percentage ABV uh, in alcohol, and it was intended to target things like uh, malt liquor, but it ended up hitting Imperial IPAs. Uh, so you need to pay attention to stuff like that. Oh, it says most states require a license to ship beer and any other alcohol. Uh, that's right. Most states require a license to ship beer into the state. This is an issue that I've been working with some folks on recently. Um, it's, uh, well, there, there are a couple of issues here, actually. There's the license to ship beer in, so you're going to need a certificate in most states to get beer into another state. Uh, so if you're in Oregon and shipping up to Washington, you're going to need a, a certificate to uh, to be uh, 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 allowed to do that. Uh, the other issue that goes along with that is direct consumer shipping, which is I think more and more breweries are starting to get on board with. Um, there are currently maybe 30 some states that allow direct consumer shipping. Uh, we're hoping that the BA makes some strides to to get more states on board with that, but. If you're going to do direct to consumer, be very careful about it. I've heard some horror stories recently about shipping into a state that allows direct to consumer, but where the shipper, the supplier, is supposed to pay a tax on that. And if you don't know about the tax, you might get hit with a substantial penalty, not paying maybe what amounts to like a two or three dollar tax. Uh, so just be very careful of that. And if you're shipping out of state to a distributor, the distributors will usually help you get through the process of getting certified for for that state oh, ted's pointing out that downtown seattle was hit by the oh i didn't know that the percentage law yeah i didn't know that yeah that's a, it's those laws are just a mess they're 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 targeted at a certain kind of conduct and they often just miss that target entirely um uh, cascade has had issues with shipping um that's exactly what i was just talking about uh, they, uh, they, they, I believe, shipped into North Dakota, and North Dakota was, um, uh, they had some kind of tax that, you know, who, who would know about some, like, some weird tax on shipping alcohol into their state, and they can issue penalties on that stuff. And I think Cascade actually shut down their entire direct consumer system based on that. Well, they're probably running at capacity, too. Yeah, they, they very well may be. 
Yeah, Ben's pointing out it's a nightmare in the wine industry too, yes. Yes, yes. it absolutely is. Yeah, it's, um, I don't even remember what ended up happening. I don't think it ended up passing in Portland, did it? Or maybe in just little narrow pockets of town. Uh, are you talking about the shipping? Yeah, he's talking about the shipping. Yeah, yeah, direct consumer shipping is, the wine industry has done a really nice job because they actually have a powerful lobby. Uh, they've done a nice job of getting some rights to ship into states, but it's still at, I think, maybe 40 states, I think, wine can be shipped into. And the and the beer lobby is building. It is. It's building. The craft beer lobby. Slowly but surely. Powerful. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about distribution. This is an area that I find particularly interesting, and I do a lot of work in this area. Um, distribution laws vary from state to state. Uh, there are control, control states and non-control states. Uh, there are franchise law states and there are non-franchise law states, but most states are going to have some variation of a franchise law. Um, those franchise laws can vary tremendously. Um, and sort of a, a growing trend is to have the franchise laws not apply to the, uh, the smaller suppliers. Uh, the Brewers Association in particular has taken a position that we get franchise laws, we understand why they're important, but they shouldn't apply to small uh, small suppliers. Um, so there should be some kind of barrelage threshold or some kind of percentage of income threshold, something like that, that decides whether you're subject to franchise law. Can you just give a brief description of what it is for some people in the class may not know what it yes. is? Yep. So franchise law, basically, uh, what, when you usually think of franchises, you think of McDonald's, right? McDonald's. Um, in, in the beer world and in some areas in the wine world uh, and cider world, but cider is, uh, is lumped in with wine often and not subject to these laws, uh, it basically says that if you're going to distribute in a particular territory, you have to use only one distribu distributor for that territory. And that distributor is going to have the exclusive right to distribute your brands within that territory. Um, often that right also comes with um, basically this sort of uh, perpetual element to it, where if you sign up with a distributor, you're signed up with them for a very long time. And they basically uh, own rights in, in your brand. So similar to if you buy a, a franchise in like a McDonald's, you're going to own that franchise and it's going to be an, it's going to be an asset of yours that has value and that you can, that you can sell similar with the beer industry. And it's the, it's the distributors, it's the, it's the beer, it's the brewer who grants the franchise and it's the distributor who purchases the franchise uh, or, or at least takes on the franchise when they don't get money for it. And they have the ability to, um, to build value in that franchise and to uh, potentially sell that franchise to another party and sometimes without even your permission or without your consent. Um, so what it means for you as the supplier is that you have to be very careful in choosing who you work with um, as your distributor. Uh, in a lot of areas, the, the, pick is, the pickings are pretty slim. Uh, but you need to make sure that you are choosing the right partner for your distribution. Uh, basically, once you get into these agreements, um, the laws vary quite a bit, but if you're going to get out of them, oftentimes you have to buy your way out. Uh, and when you buy your way out or when your next distributor buys your way out, it's done through a, a variation of different processes. One of those varieties is uh, they pay you what's been agreed to in the contract. So maybe you build in some kind of buyout multiplier and that multiplier is going to look something like, okay, you're going to buy out your, buy your franchise back from me, the distributor. You're going to pay me, um, two to seven times, uh, my growth, my, the distributor's gross profits over the past year. So whatever the growth, whatever the distributor made off of your brand in the past year, you're going to pay them two to seven times, sometimes more than that, uh, for that, uh, for, for your right to get your rights back. Um, a lot of the times I'd say the vast majority of times, it's not you, the brewery who's going to be paying for that. It's going to be 
whoever your successor distributor is. So whoever your next distributor is, is going to negotiate that and pay that amount to your current distributor. Um, it's a it's a very strange set of laws. Uh, like I said, they they differ from state to state pretty substantially. A um, couple of examples are um, Washington, state of Washington. Um, you're not going to be subject to franchise law if you if you brew under 200,000 barrels. So for most people, you're not going to have to worry about franchise law in Washington. Of course, um, the distributors will still put you under a contract that looks a heck of a lot like franchise law, but that's another issue that, that can at least be negotiated. Uh, in Vermont, I was just looking into Vermont today, um, they, you're not subject to franchise law until you've been in a distribution relationship with the distributor for a year. Once you hit that year, you are locked in and there's no way out uh, uh, unless, um, and in, this is pretty much the case in any franchise law, unless there's a breach. Uh, so if the, dis the distributor screws up in some way, um, you can claim breach and get out uh, for, for what's called cause. So you're terminating for cause. Otherwise, in a state like Vermont, you're stuck. Uh, maybe there, your next distributor can negotiate something negotiate a buyout with your current distributor, but there's you can't just voluntarily get out of that relationship even if you want to just pay for it. Uh, that's where it's states like that and states even like Oregon where you can buy your way out of a, a distribution contract that these distribution agreements become incredibly important. Um, as you can imagine, if you're going to try to get out of a, an agreement because for cause, you're going to need to make sure you can prove that cause. You need to be able to show that the distributor did something wrong. Well, if all your distribution contract says is the distributor will make good faith efforts to distribute your beer, you need to, that's not going to be good enough. You need a, an agreement that says the distributor is going to adhere to these quality controls. Your distributor is going to, uh, to you know, perform these certain obligations such as calling on retailers actually be out there trying to sell your beer they're going to maybe try to achieve certain sales thresholds uh, with your brand they're going to um, they're going to adhere to a marketing fund or a, a budgeted account for marketing where they're going to spend so much money each year on on your marketing your brand um, those are really important pieces if you're ever going to be sending them a demand letter saying hey you're not doing your job I want to get out of this agreement. Uh, another really important piece to that is the, uh, the termination provision. If you ever are going to get out of a distribution agreement, it's really nice to know how much you're going to pay for that. Uh, a lot of distribution agreements start with a provision that says something like, you're going to pay fair market value for the distribution rights. Well, try to define what that fair market value is before you get into the agreement. And that's often going to look like a some kind of a multiplier of gross profit, just like they use when uh, when you uh, uh, when one distributor is buying out another. Try to negotiate that in advance. That way, if you are if you go to your next distributor, you find somebody you think will do a better job. You can say, "I'd love for you to distribute my beer. You're going to have to buy me out. Here's how much it's going to cost." Uh, that's that's a very important piece. A lot of distributors will put up a fight against it. Uh, but you need to do whatever you can to uh, to put in some kind of reasonable compensation provision. Um, if you're in a state like Washington that doesn't have franchise law when you're small, you can try to make it that you can just get out whenever you want or with a 90 days notice or something like that. That's perfectly allowed uh, and great if you can pull it off. Um, another piece of these is uh, uh, a lot a, a big topic that always comes up when talking about distribution is, can I sell my brand to this distributor? Because you always hear these wonderful stories of such and such brewery went and, and, and got into a distribution agreement and this distributor gave them hundreds of thousands of dollars and they went out and bought all this new equipment and all these new trucks and hired a bunch of people. Those are wonderful stories. It does happen quite a bit actually, but you have to have something to sell in most cases. Um, that's where self-distribution can come in handy, uh, especially in your home turf. If you can self-distribute for a while and then sell your uh, your established distribution territory to a distributor, that's going to put money in your pocket. Uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, the distributors aren't going to give you any money unless you have that 
uh, unless you have something to sell, unless you have an established territory to sell. Um, there are exceptions to that uh, based on the state and based on the distributor, and uh, I love taking advantage of those exceptions, um, but you're, uh, it's sometimes a difficult, difficult place to get to. Okay, 10 more minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get flying here. I could talk about distribution. We do have a whole for, class on distribution. Yeah. Four yeah. or five. <laughs> I don't teach it. I would love to be I would love to be a part of that conversation, but I don't teach that one. But call me anytime and talk about distribution. I love it. Um, so elements of distribution agreement. It's going to specify your territory. Uh, it's going to specify the brands that are distributed. One strategy there is be narrow. Be narrow in your territory. Be narrow in your brands. If they do a good job for you, expand from there. Uh, I advise a lot of clients to do that. Very few actually take advantage of it. Uh, everybody wants to go all in right from the beginning. But, hey, you don't know how these guys are going to operate. Put them to the test. Um, use of intellectual property. So it's going to have your uh, licensing so they're allowed to use their trademark to market your brand. Uh, it's going to have pricing and, and payment terms or at least some kind of methodology for arriving at those and and often that's done just from by your um, your pricing sheets and then payment terms are like how soon does the distributor have to pay you for your beer especially as a new brewery try to get some really friendly payment terms like where they have to pay you within 10 days of, of uh, shipment or something like that make sure your cash flow is, is moving uh, a few more things we'll breeze through here elements of distribution agreement um, advertising and promotion, that's that marketing spend I talked about, uh, come to an agreement on how much, um, how much the distributor is going to spend on or contribute to the marketing of your brand. Uh, quality control, such as temperature controls, um, code dating uh, to watch for ex expired beer, uh, things like that. Delivery, uh, you're going to look for, you know, are they using refrigerated trucks? Uh, is your beer sitting on those trucks? Overnight, if so, you might want to make sure that it's a refrigerated truck, especially if you're down south somewhere. Uh, dispute resolution, do you want to have an arbitration provision, maybe a mediation provision, uh, some way of resolving disputes? Sometimes these are defined by uh, the state's law. It'll say if you have a dispute over termination, it's going to be arbitrated by a particular government body or particular type of arbitrator. Uh, reasonable compensation of buyout, we talked about that. Changes in ownership is a, a huge area of concern. Um, a lot of franchise laws will dictate uh, what happens when a brewery tries to, or when a distributor tries to sell to another party or tries to assign your brand to another party. Uh, and most, a lot of states you can put in there that that has to be subject to your reasonable consent. So at least you have some say in what's going on there. And maybe you're maybe you don't want to be distributed by Anheuser Busch because that you don't think they're going to take care of your brand. Well, maybe that's a reasonable basis for objecting to that change in ownership. That's what happens in the Commons, right? Yeah. How many days after they signed their agreement? Uh, I think it was about a month. Yeah, they, a month after they, the Commons signed with um, a distributorship, it got bought out by the Anheuser Busch distributor. Yeah. Yeah. So then they managed to get out of it somehow. They had a good lawyer. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the plug. Um, it's yeah, that kind of thing. It's happening more and more. And that's a great reason to have a good distribution contract because you can get absolutely screwed in those situations. And there were a lot of breweries around here freaking out when that distributor was bought by Anheuser-Busch. And some people saw it as an opportunity at, you know, tap into Anheuser-Busch's knowledge of distribution, maybe potentially into their network. Um, but a lot of people were kind of scared by that. Use of sub-distributors. I usually encourage people to look very carefully for this. Uh, some agreements will say the distributor can use whatever sub-distributors they want. Um, maybe you want to be able to have approval rights over those sub-distributors, or maybe you don't want them sub-distributing at all because if they don't directly serve that area, maybe you want to negotiate your own deal with that with the distributor in that area. Uh, it may it may that may actually reflect well on the uh, the price of your beer on the shelf at the end of the day because maybe that sub distributor is having to pitch in a buck a case to the to the primary distributor. Uh, finally, it's a negotiation. Don't be afraid to ask for more favorable terms. So many you know so many breweries come to me and they're like, 
you know, I'm afraid to ask for this because this is my distributor. It's going to be my partner in, in distributing my beer. I, don't, I want them to like me. That's fine. But uh, you can still ask. It's a negotiation. You can still ask for whatever you want in these agreements. They'll tell you whether they'll accept them or not. That's also another reason to get an attorney involved in this that takes that personal element out of the negotiation and makes it a very, very much just a business negotiation. I always tell my clients, feel free to always say, my attorney's making me do this. I don't know. He's, he's kind of a jerk. Uh, he, he told me I should do this. Uh, so I'm just going for it. Um, throw me under the bus. Oh, boy, more distribution. Tips for distribution agreements. Stab, establish specific requirements like frequency of meetings, inventory minimums, shelf life, Storage criteria, handling of cooperage, sales requirements, reporting. Uh, I talked about starting with a small territory and limited brands, uh, negotiating termination terms in advance, and negotiating what happens to distributors sold. We've already been through all this. And, of course, have it reviewed by legal counsel. Um, insurance, bonding, and liability protection. Um, these are, this just runs through some of the types of insurance you'll deal with. We go through this more in 404 in, uh, in a lot more detail. Um, and we have a guest who's an insurance agent who can talk, talk for hours about this stuff. It's really exciting. Um, but commercial general liability insurance, liquor liability, which will often be uh, mandated by the state, how much liability insurance you have to have. Um, employer practices liability. If you have more than a few employees, very good insurance to have. A lot of lawsuits arise out of employees. Uh, insurance can really make or break a company in, in some of those cases. Uh, workers' compensation, again, it's uh, usually required. Um, auto insurance, of course, personal property insurance. You can insure your tanks and equipment in case uh, bad things happen. Earthquake and flood insurance, depending on where you live. And uh, specialty, some specialty insurance is available in the brewing industry, like equipment breakdown, tank leakage, et cetera. Um, there are kind of this growing industry, like like there is in beer lawyers, there's this growing industry of in, in, beer insurers. Uh, there are a lot of very specific, brewery-specific programs out there through various insurers. So uh, look around for something like that. They can save you a ton of money because they're very narrowly tailored towards, uh, towards beverage companies. Um, bonds, you're often going to need these. Um, the TTB is going to require them in most cases. Uh, especially for, you know, if you're going to be a winery, you're going to need a, a wine bond. Uh, but in a lot of cases, in most cases, you're going to need one for brewery as well. Spirits. Uh, and spirits, definitely. Um, the bonds are intended to cover your tax liability in case uh, you don't pay them for some reason. Uh, it's basically an insurance policy for your taxes. Uh, so a lot of times your insurance agent can help you, help get you hooked up with that. And the TTB uh, or your state, licensing body is uh, usually going to tell you what you need for that. Um, and then liability protection, you're just going to want to make sure to take care of all your corporate formalities, and uh, which we talked about some of that in the, in the last class. And uh, you're going to want to make sure your company is ad adequately capitalized, which is a huge problem in the brewing industry. Everybody's trying to start up these companies on a shoestring over budget for these companies. Make sure you have enough money to cover all of your anticipated liabilities. Uh, financing is another issue we'll talk about in much more depth in 404, but just to run through some uh, some things to be thinking about as you put your business plan together, how, how are you going to fund this thing? Um, institutional financing is banks, uh, bank loans. Private equity is where you have people who buy a portion of your business and give you money for it. Uh, private loans, same thing, uh, private individuals or uh, companies that will loan you money that, that are not financial institutions. Um, municipal public development organizations, uh, those are uh, maybe a, an organization in your area that will provide loans for the purposes of improving a particular area of the city or the county. Um, crowdfunding, we all know and love the Kickstarter and Indiegogo and uh, uh Brew, uh, craft brew, which one is, is one that Christian is on? People. Yeah, craft, oh boy. Craft funding. I apologize. Like craft that. fund, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I blanked like on that one. On it right now. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty nice little site. I like it. Um, 
Uh, and then there's another type of crowdfunding that you'll be hearing more and more about, which is an actual, you know, securities crowdfunding where you can sell a portion of ownership in your business through crowdfunding. But that's, uh, it's becoming a better option. It's not quite there yet. Landlord tenant improvements. We talked about that, how that can take some of your build out and apportion that payment over a certain amount of time. Um, and then we can look at some in income sources, such as uh, the sale of your brand rights to a distributor, uh, contract brewing, if you have excess capacity, which as Melly and I were talking about before class, nobody we need has. more of that. <laughs> nobody has excess capacity? Yeah, nobody has excess capacity. Um, That's nice. Selling beer for life for an investment of $2,000. <laughs> right. <laughs> We That's should probably go to the last slide because we're out of I time. I think the last slide is just, oh, employment issues. Um, okay, we have time. No time, so just take a look at this. I wasn't going to get into we'll any detail on slides. this anyway. Yeah, they'll be posted. I think they're actually posted already. Um, and these are all issues that you should talk with uh, um, with a lawyer about anyway when, it come, when the time comes. But the biggest, I'll just point out one thing there, trade secrets. If you want to protect recipes, protect them under confidentiality agreements. Uh, make sure that they are, uh, your brewers and whoever has access to your recipes are subject to confidentiality agreements. And that's all I'll say about that. We just want to close leaving Marcus's contact information up here. Uh, if anybody has a quick question, we can probably answer a question or two if they're quick ones. Otherwise, you can send an email to Marcus yeah. with your specific things and, um, he often gives one question for free. No, <laughs> something, I, something like that. that. I guess that's the policy. <laughs> I've, I've answered multiple questions, I think, before. Uh, and if you're in town, I'm always happy to grab a beer with somebody, too. Uh, I've done that with a couple of a uh, couple of folks in these classes, and that's always enjoyable. Yeah, and Marcus goes to the big shows. Are you going to CiderCon, too? I don't know about well, that. Well, Maria and I are going to CiderCon, and she can answer some questions, yes. too. Yeah, I might try to make it for that. But yeah. Okay. Discount <laughs> rates for I'll work on that. That's actually an interesting idea. Good idea, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry we, we didn't get through all the slides to the last detail, but pretty much through. We almost got there. The employment's <laughs> so boring anyway. But thanks everybody for join joining us tonight. Um yes, and the slides will be the recording will be posted. The slides are posted as pointed out by Daniel. And we look forward to seeing you guys taking 404, you can learn a lot of stuff in depth there and get to work on your TTP application. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we get we get into the nitty gritty there. We <laughs> Super just, nuts and bolts. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. So and that's right, Craft Brewers Conference, Portland, April 2015. Yeah, so everybody all should come. Here. We're all there. It's gonna be fantastic. We'll have some kind of party. Absolutely. We always have a party for all our students and alumni, <laughs> our alumni from the business of craft brewing program. That's All right. right, great turnout tonight. Great seeing you guys. Good luck with the polar vortex. Those of you being affected. Yeah, aren't we all being affected? I think We're so, just yeah. getting the wind. Yeah. Okay, take care, and we are signing off. Cheers. Cheers.